Hello there, today we will be going through LLM's large language models on how you can use that with your own data. So uh, before I get started, these videos are meant for people to get an early introduction into these new uh, ML, um, ML phenomena, I guess, right, uh, around large language models. And I'll start with very easy explanations. And in this screen, you'll see ChatGPT on one side. Let me use uh, my pointer here. So when you enter um, a, a question, uh, it becomes a part of a prompt uh, within ChatGPT. It goes and talks to these hosted LLMs. In this case, it could be the ChatGPT, GPT-4, LLMs, <clears throat> no, GPT, GPT 3.5 LLMs, and it comes back with a response, right? So you prompt it, you send a prompt, and you get a response back, right? Uh, and when you look at LLMs, which are pre-trained or trained uh, beforehand, um, these LLMs are trained on a lot of data beforehand. And these large language models are uh, work with a lot of massive amount of examples at an extraordinary cost the, the uh, pre-training computes the underlying parameters. <clears throat> so they, uh, the large language models are pre-trained and they also have human feedback for re reinforcement learning, but they come, like I said, at an extraordinary cost and uh, the computes the underlying parameters, usually weights and biases in a neural network, right? So these are neural networks in order to um, help improve the model's predictions and, uh, you know, the uh, to minimize the differences or losses between the model's predictions. And since they work on a lot of data, <clears throat> it's usually very, very hard to start from scratch. You cannot use, I mean, unless you have plenty of money, um, it's not easy to start from scratch. What you can do with your data are two possible paths. And when you talk about users, prompting and getting some responses back, you know, prompting, getting some responses back here. There are two possible ways you can work with your own data. And when you look at these two possibilities, one is taking an existing LLM and fine tuning it with your data. And the second possibility usually is what we call in-context learning. Okay, so let's see what these two mean. Step or the option number one, is fine tuning and option number one with fine tuning is is again uh, a much more um, better option than pre-training because it's computationally expensive like i mentioned and it has usually a large unlabeled corpus unlabeled training and it takes you know greater than 10 or maybe even 100 millions of dollars to make this happen and for uh, companies, it's better to do go down this path of using a cheaper option, which is fine-tuning. And usually with fine-tuning, you take the same LLM, which has been pre-trained, and you point that to a small labeled corpus of your enterprise data or your own data, right? And comes back with a much more targeted um, LLM, a, much more, a model which is trained with your data. Uh, so fine-tuning is very powerful since the original, um, you know, large um, neural network would have learned general type of features, which are then used to quickly learn new features related to your use case, to your business use case. So an option, definitely. Uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the, I can give some examples. For example, you could have your own product images inside your company. You can use a pre-trained model which has been trained on general images, general products, let's say beverages, for example. And then you can use additional um, techniques on a smaller training sample, which is localized to your company. You, know, you could use things, techniques like um, edge detection, uh, you know, you can fine tune on your own local data set, so it comes up with much more, much more precise responses. Okay, so let's go to option two. So I talked about option one, which is fine tuning; it's cheaper. But option two is the most popular option, and it's in context learning. So in this case, what happens is you have a prompt, and this prompt, in during the creation of the prompt, you can 
input some examples uh, into the model during the inference stream. So what does a prompt look like? It's uh, it's a contextually engineered prompt and it typically has these three components, an instruction, some context, and a question around that context. So let's look at an example around this most popular learning method called in context. So a big, uh, you know, text here, collection of text. So this text is, you know, uh, uh, well, let's start with the instruction side. Answer a question as truthfully as possible, provided with the provided text, and the answer sh uh, uh, is not contained within text below. Say, I don't know, right? So you're giving very clear, precise instructions. If you don't have an answer, give me an I don't know answer, right? And the context here is some text, which is uh, around the Summer Olympics and between a certain time frame. And, and there are some Italian athlete along with some Qatari athlete who has won. And then the question is, very precise, who won the 2020 Summer Olympics uh, men's, jump, men's high jump. So instruction, context, which is the actual text, and a, a specific question. So that's how usually a prompt is uh, created, such that the LLMs can be very precise with the answer or response, uh, um, and uh, sometimes called completion. Um, a response is sometimes called completion in LLM, lingo but when you look at this this context is has a problem this context has a problem and the context problem is usually around the length of the context itself <clears throat> and i'm bringing this up because we will progress uh, at a later stage in this video to talk about how this even affects you with your own data but any context for most llms has a limitation and it's usually limited to around thousands of tokens, right? So if you look at this text here on the right-hand side, there's a uh, the context for GPT-3, the, there's a limitation, right? And they come, let's come back with 68 tokens. So uh, a token is somewhat three-fourths of uh, a normal word, an English word. So if you look at this text, this has come back with 68 tokens. And uh, it includes commas, punctuations, um, and, uh, uh, you know, even numbers as a token. So when you have a limit like that for an LLM, then you cannot send too much information as context into an LLM. So what do you do with your own data? That's a challenge when you have a limitation of roughly 1,000 tokens, right? So so let's step back for a bit and let's look at the architecture again. So you have uh, to send all this data to an LLM, which is instruction, context, and question. Usually, usually the question is provided by the user themselves. Instruction is also provided by the user. But if your context has to come from your data, your own private data, then what do you do, right? That's what I'm trying to answer here. So there's this component you can use within LLMs, uh, which is a storage component for building up context. And it's it's called, uh, in, the la in the world of LLMs, it's called vector databases or vector indexes. And you can provide, you can use that to provide context for LLMs. And if you, if you remember, I used a thing called instruction in the past, but I've taken that and combined that with the question. So your question could be, you know, like uh, the previous example I had was, who is, uh, who's the winner of the 2022 or 2020 Olympics in long jump? And uh, please provide me a, and you could combine a question and instruction together. Uh, question plus instruction say please provide me a very precise answer or please provide me uh, the gold winner or gold medal winner right so you can combine questions and uh, instructions and that's why I simplified this diagram you can use a context and you can use a question like I said a question is provided by a user and in this case the data you have is provided by a database called a uh, called a vector database, right? So this is a very high level of view of what is required to provide for an LLM architecture which works with your data. 
right? So now let's break it down a little more. Let's break it down and look at the sequences supporting it. So step one, uh, there is a user providing a question. And uh, the first step the question does is, the user query or the question uh, is, it queries a database. It queries a vector database. <clears throat> And then the vector database comes back with relevant results, uh, similar results based on that question. So there's a similarity search which is happening and provides a small subset of vectors uh, based on the documents or a collection of uh, document uh, vectors which can be passed back on into the context. So I'll repeat that again. A user query can be converted into a query which is familiar to the vector database. The vector database responds with, res, uh, responds with uh, a subset of similar, uh, you know, documents or vectors. And then it takes that and you can provide that back into the context, right? So now you can, ex it's an external database. You can get that data coming into the context. And number three is the same question or the query which the user asked, <clears throat> will be combined with a context, which comes from an external source, and passed on to an LLM, typically an API call, uh, into an LLM, and the LLM responds back, uh, back to the user. So these are the high-level pieces of an LLM architecture, which includes data coming from your data source. And in this case, I said, like I said, the data has to be stored typically in a vector database or in a vector index for this to work. So let's go one more level deep and explain some more components of this architecture. So same architecture, I added a little more extra diagrams or labeling here. So let's go through this again. You are, there's a UI component uh, in red, which you, where the user can enter a question, a query, which gets converted into a uh, a friendly query, and when you do a friendly query, this additional thing which I've added here uh, is called a question embedding because this is stored in these, the vector database has, uh, has vectors in it, word vectors, um, uh, word vector embeddings in it, and the question has to be con converted into a question embedding before it can be compared uh, uh, or used within a vector database. So just like you have a SQL database where you can ask a SQL query, it's not really a user query, but it's a SQL syntax. Just like that, you could have a question embedding which could be used to query a vector database, right? So this vector database is the storage layer. You had a UI component, you have a storage layer, and this storage layer has some data. Now let's go a little more deeper in, which I haven't explained before in my previous slide, is this data is a conversion of, you know, it could be PDF files from your organization. It is converted into some kind of embedding. So you see this term I'm using again and again. It is taking the document, converting that into embeddings, because some of these documents could be large enough, you convert them into chunks and you convert them into embedding. So all this is uh, in a similar data format, right? And some of this time, some of this uh, documents could be, uh, you know, this, there could be information like metadata along with the documents, like who wrote these docu documents, when was it last updated, what is it about? All that could be stored within the vector database, okay? So these two things, A and B, which I've labeled here, can be done, you know, um, uh, separately, it doesn't have to be done within this whole flow, but can be done separately and stored into the database beforehand. However, if you want somewhat real-time information, you have to do this on a, in a real-time basis. An example is you need to pull or scrape something from a website. You could do that dynamically and again, still convert into an embedding, push that into a vector database. <clears throat> so so uh, uh, in the previous, uh, previous um, slide, I had mentioned uh, this comes back with some type of relevant information, right? Because you query this and you can get back relevant information. You could use different algorithms to get similar, based on the query, get the similar types of documents which match this query and you could get these results, right? And you could use uh, nearest neighbor algorithms, uh, semantic search to get back these documents. Now all these blue lines, you see these blue lines are helping you get something back, right? All these blue lines. So 
usually in your architecture, you have some kind of service which helps with this or chaining type of service or chaining type of package or a pipelining package which helps you get data. So going all the way from a question, you know, helping you build this context, right? Going from a question, look, querying a vector database and building this context, you could do all this stuff using some kind of libraries, open source libraries to either it's called a service library or chaining library or pipelining library. This chain library can also be used with your LLMs to uh, chain prompts. I'm not going to that into this video. We will have a separate video for that. But you could, uh, you know, chain prompts and you could get some responses coming from your model. So let's look at these red pieces one more time. A UI component to ask questions and get responses. You have a storage layer. You have this uh, service chain or pipeline layer uh, used interchangeably, service or chain or pipeline. Uh, layer and most importantly the model itself right the model layer so these four pieces actually forms your architecture let's do a quick recap now if you remember we talked about two ways you could use uh, your own data with LLMs one is fine-tuning an existing model uh, which is cheap but still pretty intensive or the most popular one which is the in-context learning Right, And when we talked about context learning, we went a little more deeper. We talked about context limitations with context tokens. You have a, you cannot add in too many, too many, um, uh, cont too many tokens into your prompt. Uh, and therefore you have to find a solution. And the solution is with your data is take your data, push that into a storage layer called vector database or vector indexes. And you can create an architecture based on that. And uh, so the f summary of the major components of a LLM architecture is fourfold. You have a UI layer, think ChatGPT UI, where you can ask questions and get responses. You have a storage layer, think think vector database or vector indexes. You have a model layer, which could be you know your externally hosted model like uh, GPT-4, GPT-3.5 on OpenAI, or your own model, which you can host internally. If you think about hosting uh, or running LLMs within your architecture, it's best to think long term with hosting your own models. It's a little more, uh, you know, there's more work, but long term, if that is going to be strategic for your business or for yourself, it's best to host it internally and running it with your own uh, people. So, and then the last thing which goes across all three usually is, or at least across the storage and model layer, is the service or chaining or pipelining layer. Most LLMs are uh, require a lot of pipelining, a lot of thinking through on who's going to access the data, how you're going to access the data, how you're going to uh, clean up the data, add metadata, all the stuff happens in the pipelining layer, right? So this is, these are the four, one, two, three, four components, which I highlighted here in the architecture, these red elements, which will help you with running LLMs with your own data. This is the LLM architecture, a high level LLM architecture for um, uh, making sure you can run that within your organization. Thank you.